Welcome to La Historia, the show where we're about to discuss Christopher Columbus for the first time. This won't be controversial at all. So welcome to the Dominican Republic, uh, not in alphabetical order. As I said in the last episode, Algeria, I am now doing every country in random order decide at the end of each episode. So last week, we, uh, I hit the generator and it gave us the DR. So welcome to Hispaniola. So the first thing we're going to start with is the indigenous people of the Dominican Republic. Um, the indigenous people of a lot of islands in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, many, and even Cuba. The Taino people. In the late 15th century, when you know who arrived, the Taino people called the island Kiskeya, or Mother of All Lands, and they also called it Aidi, which is Land of the Mountains, or Land of High Mountains. The, Ch the Taino chieftains, which I will uh, put the map right here, were made up of Marien, Magua, Maguana, Haragua, and Higuay. Here are also the respective rulers of each Taino chiefdom. Now we arrive at 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. You all know the story. He arrived in what was then called Hispaniola, and uh, but didn't really set up any colonies until 1493 on his second voyage, when he set up the colony of La Isabella, I wonder who that was named after, on the northeastern shore. Three years later, in 1496, Santo Domingo was built, which became the new capital, and it was where the first New World Cathedral was built. A little note on Santo Domingo, it really became the administrative capital of the new emerging Spanish Empire. It was a huge center for culture and trade, and even guys like, like Francisco Pizarro and Hernan Cortez lived and worked in Santo Domingo for some time. But as you can imagine, none of these things went hunky-dory. In January of 1493, Canalbo, leader of the Maguana chiefdom, led attacks on the Spanish and at first killed just a few Spaniards, but about a couple years later he managed to encircle them and kill 40 Spaniards. The final battle was in 1495 on Columbus's last trip, when where 10,000 Tainos fought but they were, they were overpowered by the Spanish's superior weaponry. Between the years of 1494 and 1496, an estimated 100,000 Taino people died, half of which took their own lives by starvation, jumping off of cliffs, poisoning, etc., etc., etc. Turns out, when people have their own lands, they don't like a bunch of guys from the other side of the world coming in or coming over and like, oh look, your resources. Who would have guessed? Now to touch on uh, to touch on somebody who's going to become quite important in all of our episodes on Latin America, all the colonies that the Spanish conquered, Bartolome de las Casas, the former conquistador turned monk who was very very anti-colonialist for the time. This, this guy wrote multiple eyewitness accounts of Columbus's voyages and his doings abroad. I will quickly read this, de, this quote from Bartolome de las Casas. Into this land of meek outcasts, there came some Spaniards who immediately behaved like ravening wild beasts, wolves, tigers, or lions that had been starved for many days. And Spaniards have behaved in no other way during the past 40 years, down to the present time, for they are still acting like ravening beasts, killing, terrorizing, afflicting, torturing, and destroying the native peoples, doing all this with the strangest and most varied new methods of cruelty. So yeah, uh, turns out Bartolome de las Casas was not a fan of what Columbus was up to. Go figure. So here comes the turn of the 16th century in 1501. Ferdinand and Isabella, the monarchs, granted the first transport of African slaves to the New World. 
and they started arriving a couple years later in 1503. They were first purchased in Lisbon, Portugal, but also some of them came over from the West African Guinea coast. Um, and so to even muddy and nuance the waters a little bit more, a lot of Africans, both free and enslaved, took part in the conquest of the New World by the Spanish. This was due to the fact that Spain had been multi-ethnic and multi-racial for centuries before they even thought of expanding into the world. So in 1510, the first sizable shipment, about 250 black Ladinos, arrived in Hispaniola. Um, of course, most of these, just like the, ty the enslaved Taino people, were used to mine gold on the island. And about eight years after that, in 1518 CE, many African slaves arrived in the West Indies. So yeah, what is now like Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, um, many of those places. A lot of them were losers of the African tribal wars um, in the sub-Saharan areas, given over to Spanish and Portuguese slavers and some of them were straight up kidnapped from their villages by said slavers so yeah so i guess the narratives from both political spectrums uh the one that says oh it's all the white it's oh it's the colonizers fault for enslaving and kidnapping these people it's all it's all them to blame and the people who say oh it's just african on african war and tribal that uh that basically just helped the the colonizers both those narratives have been severely subverted and muddied sorry guys So jumping forward a bit to the mid 1500s and 16th century, there were thousands of maroons or runaways in Hispaniola. So again, here's another go figure with La Historia. People don't like to be enslaved. The Bajaruco Mountains were the uh, main source of runaways. Uh, many of those people just got to high ground, you know, hiding in the mountains in the dark. Pretty good strategy for the time. Although a lot of Africans escaped to other islands as well, things that, places that hadn't really been touched by the Spanish. Quickly jumping back a few years early in 1517, a guerrilla war was, in ra was raged by Taino leader in Raquilo. He descended from the Bajaruco Mountains and killed a whole bunch of Spaniards. Uh, this war was kind of crazy for the new Spanish, obviously. The crown appointed general Francisco Barrio Nuevo uh, led the fight against the Tainos, but eventually in Lake Jaragua, now in Raquilo Lake, they reached a peace treaty and agreement in 1593. The first known armed rebellion by the African slaves took place in 1591 on the Diego Columbus plantation on Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas, we're breaking out. So go figure, the Spanish expanded past just these little islands and started to conquest the American mainland. So most of the Spanish uh, occupiers of the, the now Dominican Republic fled for the silver mines of Peru and Mexico. Agriculture dwindled, um, trade dwindled, new imports of slaves ceased. The island was struck by poverty, so white colonists, free blacks, and slaves alike, poor. Fast forwarding to 1586, the pirate Sir Francis Drake of England um, came and captured the city of Santo Domingo collecting a ransom to return it to Spanish rule. There was actually a story where Sir Francis Drake sent a little black boy to deliver a message to the governor from him, but a Hidalgo, who was a non-royal blooded Spanish noble, got insulted with the boy and murdered him. Uh, Sir Francis Drake was understandably pissed about this and had the Hidalgo hanged. So just fast forwarding a bit through the end of the 16th century, 1592, Christopher Newport attacked the city of Azua. 
Just, just a whole bunch of inner bickering with English and Spanish. Go figure. So at the turn of the 17th century, the 1600s, the Spanish were kind of mad because the because the islands were carrying out illegal and uh, and honestly profitable trade with the Dutch, which was a rivaling colonial European power. The Spain, the Spain, obviously didn't like this because the Dutch were fighting a war of independence against the Spanish. So they were like, no, you must not, you must not trade with those uh, dirty people who like the weed. I'm gonna get in trouble for these offensive accents one day, aren't I? This prompted the English to resettle their people in the city of Santo Domingo. This action, known as the Devastaciones de Osorio, was as you can imagine, really maddening for the poor Spanish. I don't want to keep talking about the Spanish wars with uh, other European powers like the Habsburg dynasty in Austria-Hungary and blah da 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 Honestly ended up in more exporting of African slaves, getting them out of there and getting rising interest in Santo, Santo Domingo and then losing interest in the island that is now the Dominican Republic. So we're gonna fast forward all the way to 1809 and the newer Spanish colony that at the time had a population of about 104,000 people. 30,000 of these were slaves and um, the rest were a mixture of black, white, and even Indian descents. There were quite a few European Spaniards left on the island, as you might imagine, and predominantly they were Catalan. In 1812, same year that my people defeated the U.S., um, um, a group of black people and mulattoes, that is, black and white, staged rebellion in the new Spanish colony, and this was another one of many rebellions against the Spanish occupying powers. The hold on the island just waned and remained precarious, all the way until 1815 when the fugitive by the name of Simon Bolivar, we will get to him, uh, alarmed the Spanish with his followers in Haiti. There was an army from the Spanish rebellion in 1820. This, this caused a lot of the Spanish army generals to break with the motherland. This culminated on the 1st of December 1821 when Lieutenant Governor Jose Nunez de Caceres proclaimed the independence of Spanish Haiti. There was a unification of Hispaniola in 1822, and there was actual Haitian occupation between 1822 and 44, and I kind of want to go into that, but I've honestly taken up a lot of time in this episode just talking about the Spanish conquest and Spanish occupation in that island, so I will just link it down below. On the 16th of July, 1838, a secret society known as La Trinitaria was formed. With the, with the following leaders. This was to win independence from, at the time, French Haiti. Then forwarding a bit through a D Dominican War of Independence, we reached the Dominican Republic's first constitution signed into law on the 6th of November, 1844. It featured, a, it featured a presidential form of government with many liberal tendencies. It was marred by Constitutional Article 210, imposed by one Pedro Santana, which gave him dictator-like powers until the War of Independence was over. Pedro Santana had inherited a corrupt government on the brink of collapse. He tried to have it reconverted into a Spanish colony. The US really couldn't help out with the Monroe Doctrine because they were in the middle of a civil war. August 16th, 1863, the declaration of war began in Santiago, Chile. Briefly touching May 15, 1916, United States troops landed in Santo Domingo, which began the U.S. Op occupation of the island. The U.S. occupation did last for quite a few years with, uh, of course, military bases there until they withdrew in 1920s under Republican President Warren Harding, and the Third Republic, beginning with Horacio Vasquez, lasted from 1924 to 1965. The Fourth Republic began in 1966, and the Dominican has since gone through so many leaders, from, from the second presidency of Balaguer, to Guzman and Bianco, to two administrations by President Fernandez, and now today with Danilo Medina. The Dominican Republic was our first foray into what we used to be colonized by the Spanish 
empire, one of the most expansive and, if you ask some historians, most brutal empires in history. And of course it was our introduction to one Christopher Columbus. I'm really glad that the first spin of the generator brought us to this country because it uh, opened our eyes to the discovery of the new world. Um, kind of left the old world behind for a second. Our first three episodes were on countries that were very old and had and have histories spanning back to who knows when. And this one does too. We just don't know really anything about the Tainos. Let's be honest, their history was erased. Whether you want to whether you want to complain about that or what however you may take it, the Taino history was erased. So we really were forced to begin in 1492. And I'm really glad we had mouthpieces like Bartolome de las Casas that gave us the real lens into what was going on. I spent I spent quite a bit of time filming this episode. I didn't I didn't think I would because it's a tiny island nation where Americans and mostly Canadians go to vacation every summer. But <laughs> it's the the Dominican Republic is a bit more than that. Well, now comes that time. The next country will be. Lithuania. We'll see you then.